Um, here we are. Uh, this uh, is one of a series of short chats which are intended for the readers of the Angel Mountain Saga. I'm doing uh, a series of seven uh, short talks each evening. Uh, right at the very beginning, I want to apologize for those of you who were tuned in last night at seven o'clock. We had a bit of a technical glitch, I'm afraid. About five minutes to seven, uh, Google Chrome in its infinite wisdom decided to, to do a security update on my computer. <laughs> and in the process of doing that, they wiped off all the permissions for uh, Facebook to use the camera on the computer. And uh, it was here and it took a long time to, um, to, to get that uh, restored to working order. It took us almost an hour to work out how to do the fixes in order to get things up and running. Anyway, here we are. And um, uh, today I shall give the little chat that I originally intended to give uh, yesterday. This one is called Martha's Magic, and it's about the um, role of the supernatural in the Angel Mountain stories. Uh, it's quite an important role, in fact, as, as readers will know. And uh, I want to just talk about not only Martha's um, uh, instinct for and, and, and ability to see things, but also a little bit about the, uh, the background as well. Uh, to start right at the very beginning, we have to uh, bear in mind something that I uh, picked up on at a very early stage when I was trying to write down the story of Martha as it was originally given to me. Uh, and I had to learn quite a lot about um, how to structure uh, stories, etc., etc. Uh, it was um, not an easy thing to do. But I actually um, uh, picked up on one piece of advice at a very early stage, which was uh be sure that you do as a writer of historical fiction that you that you don't try to populate your stories with modern people in fancy dress and that was a very important piece of advice and i've tried to bear that in mind right the way through so i tried right at the very beginning and right through the writing of the saga to be true to the mindset or the belief systems of people living in uh, a rural district in the far west of Wales in the Regency period and, and the early Victorian period. Uh, and we have to bear in mind, of course, that uh, this is all pre-Darwin. The origin of species hadn't been written. There was a very strong belief in the Bible, that the Bible was true. Uh, everything that was in the Bible was true. The, the, the earth was created by God in seven days. The Garden of Eden existed. Uh, Noah's flood happened. Um, and um, uh, all of these sort of features were accepted as, as a part of uh, the truth of things. Uh, if you um, didn't feel inclined to believe all of that, then uh, it probably wasn't a very good idea to um, uh, talk about it too much. You, you simply ignored some of these beliefs because uh, maybe you had your doubts about the scientific validity of, uh, of what was being taught at that time from the pulpits of the churches and chapels throughout the land. But it's rather interesting that in, in Wales, there's a very, very long tradition, of course, of uh, a belief in something other than the wisdom contained within the Bible. There's a very strong belief in, uh, in the supernatural and, and, and in magic. And if you go back to the, to the very earliest written stories in, into the map, an incredible storehouse of, of, uh, of treasures, literary treasures, there is a huge amount in the Mabinogion which involves magic and magicians. Uh, you have people like Gwydion, who is the probably the most uh, prominent of the magicians. Not a very nice chap, actually. Completely untrustworthy and treacherous. Uh, betrayed people left, right and centre. Very vengeful as well. So although he wasn't a very nice chap, um, uh, certainly this, this tradition of, of um, witchcraft and magic was a very strong one, which continued right through to relatively modern times. And indeed, it goes on to today. There are still some people living in my own community, um, some who have recently died, uh, who had uh, um, a reputation for perhaps triggering off unpleasant things if, <laughs> if you got on the wrong side of them. Uh, and uh, there are two neighbors of mine, both dead now, sadly, uh, who uh, both had a, um, a reputation of being in touch with another world um, and uh, an ability to place curses on people if you were not very careful. 
Uh, and so this tradition of witchcraft um, and, and magic goes right the way through to relatively modern times. And we have to bear in mind also that, that there was an extraordinary tolerance for the things that witches and wizards did and said. And it's not widely known that in Wales, this was the only part of Europe that actually uh, never experienced the burning of a witch at the stake uh, for the heresy of witchcraft. Right throughout Europe in the 1500s in particular, Europe was going mad and, and there was this witch hunt going on everywhere. Thousands and thousands of poor innocent women were, were burnt at the stake. But in Wales, there wasn't a single burning. And it's interesting that, um, uh, that witches were tolerated more or less. They were, uh, people were a little bit frightened of them maybe, but they were accepted as people who, <laughs> who did a job, just like uh, carpenters or farmers or, or, or dairymen or whatever. Um, and um, mostly it was elderly women, of course, who were living on their own, who got a reputation for perhaps casting spells in order, uh, in exchange for kindnesses. And so you would perhaps give um, an elderly woman uh, some little gifts or something, and she would, um, she would then refrain from, from, from uh, casting a spell on you. Um, so they weren't, and if, if any of these old ladies got a little bit out of hand and started to get too aggressive, they were usually just sent packing. There was no question that they would be uh, taken and burnt at the stake. Much more powerful were the wizards. And it's interesting that they weren't called wizards or conjurers in Wales. They were called dun husbis, which, which means an, the knowing ones, the, the, the knowing man. And these wizards were much more powerful than the witches. They could, they could override or, or reverse any spells that were cast by, by the witches, etc. And they were rather interesting characters because they uh, had a reputation of being dentists. They were scholars. They were herbalists. They were detectives and sleuths who would be called upon very often to put right petty crimes that might, and indeed serious crimes that might have been going on inside in, in a community. Uh, and so they were very much revered. And in the stories, um, we actually have um, uh, an ever an ever present uh, magician uh, who happens to be a mentor for uh, for Martha in the. Early part of the stories, the, uh, the magician is Joseph Harris, who really did exist. He lived at Werendew, not, not far from Dinas, on, on the, uh, a little bit to the west of Carningley Mountain. Um, he was a very well-known figure. There are many stories about him still in circulation. Um, and in the stories, I've hijacked Joseph Harris and turned him into Martha's key ally in all sorts of desperate situations. And she turns to, um, to Joseph for help over and over again. When Joseph dies a little bit later on in the saga, his role is taken by Shemi Jenkins, a young man, very unprepossessing young man who was a farm laborer. Uh, but uh, Joseph recognizes in him the ability uh, to be um, a done husbis and trains him up in some of the esoteric arts in order to carry on that tradition. And then right at the end of the saga, there's another a magician again, uh, who happens to be a little boy called Merlin, uh, right at the very end of the, of, of the story. Um, and so these magicians are ever present. They, they advise uh, Martha and get her out of all sorts of ticklish situations. <laughs> um, but in addition to that, Martha herself um, has got certain powers that she is very concerned about. She doesn't actually understand them at all. She has premonitions. She sees battles in the sky. She, um, uh, she doesn't know how to interpret them originally. She gets very frightened about her ability to foresee things. And she has many discussions with Joseph Harris, who advises her over and again uh, that she should treat this as a gift. She shouldn't be too frightened about the ability to, to see things before they happen. And she has to learn that she cannot actually change the course of events. She has to accept that when she foresees something that is about to happen or it will happen at some unknown time in the future, she simply has to accept that that, that will happen. And the prior knowledge that she has is simply there to enable her to cope with the situation a little bit better. And Joseph insists to Martha over and over again that she must never divulge to anybody else that she knows what is going to happen either to them or to their community or, or whatever and she finds this knowledge very difficult to um, uh, to, to live with 
but she gets used to it in the end and she does have lessons from uh, Joseph because Joseph uh, says to her several times that there are very few people who, ha who possess these powers um, and that they have to be handled with, with very great care. So we have these two components then. We have Martha's own involvement in the supernatural and her own knowledge of it and the, and the much greater wisdom of the established magicians or, or uh, wise men uh, who are formally trained in, in some of the esoteric wisdom um, that, um, of course, still exists even, even today. So I was quite attracted by the idea of building the, the supernatural into the stories because in addition to the supernatural, we have Folk tales, of course, a great tradition for local folk tales, many different superstitions as well, particularly in, in, in rural areas. And right from the, from the beginning, um, this is the story as it came to me. Martha had these powers. Joseph Harris was in the story as it was given to me. And so I had to find ways of, of introducing these supernatural elements at intervals through the stories in, in a way that made um, a certain amount of sense. So the story right from the very beginning was nothing like Paul Dark or Downton Abbey, in other words, a, a straight down the line historical drama or historical story. And it wasn't either anything like um, Outlander or Harry Potter or, um, or Game of Thrones, all of which, of course, are completely absurd. Um, and, and you simply have to dispend, uh, suspend a huge amount of, uh, of disbelief uh, in order to absorb yourself and get involved in the, in the stories. I wanted um, Angel Mountain, the saga, and this is indeed as it came to me. I wanted it to be something which was um, a historical romance, a historical tragedy as well, uh, but an as accurate and as straightforward as I could make it, filled with adventure and violence as it is, but with a little bit of added spice in the form of the, of the supernatural. And I hope I've actually succeeded in doing that. Um, and I've had many comments from people who uh, have actually said that they quite enjoyed some of these elements because sometimes it's difficult to know how seriously I, as an author, have actually taken them. Um, and you, you take them with, with a pinch of salt if you want to, and if you want to believe them, then that's fine. So that's where we'll uh, finish things for today. Tomorrow um, I shall uh, be here again, God willing, and, and as long as the technology is working at, at seven o'clock, and I shall give you another little chat about one of the other uh, components in the Angel Mountain Saga. You can uh, uh, follow the, uh, you can see this chat again if you want to on, on the Facebook page. And also, if you're interested, you can subscribe for the Angel Mountain newsletter, which comes out every now and then. And I shall be doing one in a, in, a, in a few days' time. And if you want to add your name to the mailing list, you'll be very welcome to do that. Okay, that's enough for this evening. Uh, very good evening to you all. Uh, keep, keep safe, keep well, enjoy the weather while we can. And uh, maybe I'll see you again tomorrow evening. Bye-bye for now.